I know I said in the last video I'm gonna make a fishing reel. I think that I've thought of a way to make a fishing reel. I'm just not 100% prepared to do that yet because I need a tool, a lathe. I have one ordered. I'm gonna go pick it up today actually. In the meantime, I wanna make a cool lure because that's kind of what I do, you know? Ugh, I've been debating on what lure to make. I kind of want to go back to like the the insects and the, the very out of the box kind of baits because they're fun. I figured it out. I know what bug I'm gonna make. <laughs> A toe biter. Oh, I need to build a stand for this. Well, I have a lathe now. Did I do fun facts in the last couple? I don't think I've, I think it's been a couple videos since I've done fun facts. But with this lure, we can do fun facts again. And we can actually have fun now. Okay, just gotta get to the Toe Biter wiki page. Oh, Toe Biter is not their real name. Um, okay, there isn't a little thing that helps me pronunciate this big word, so I have to sound it out. Be Bellostomatidia. That's the real name. They're also called the giant water bug. And electric light bugs and alligator ticks. Ooh, that's a cool name. They're big. Uh, let me get a good measurement for you. Yeah, these things are no joke. The largest members of the genus, they ex they can exceed 12 centimeters, so four and a half inches, which is bigger than this. There it is next to my face for comparison. That's big. I'm seeing pictures as I scroll through this of these things with their eggs on their back and it's disgusting. One here. Look at that. Why, God? <sighs> they are predators that are typically encountered in freshwater ponds, marshes, and slow flowing streams. So they don't like fast current. The majority of these types of bugs are found in the neotropics in uh, kind of below Mexico and, and then in South America. There's 20 in Africa and there's, uh, there's some in the United States, not that many. And then there's also some in Southeast Asia. So these are not too commonly on the menu for fish around here. So they have a flat body. Their legs are also pretty flat. It's gonna be interesting how to, what I'm gonna come up with to make those legs. I'm not, I'm not too sure yet. Yep, they got the two claws tucked behind the eyes and short, they have short antennas and a short breathing tube that retracts into its abdomen. And the adults cannot breathe underwater. They gotta breathe air. Yep, they use it as a little snorkel. I don't think I'm gonna make this one with a extended breathing tube. I think I'm gonna leave it retracted. They use the big frontal leg uh, as raptorial appendages and grab onto their prey. But there's one toe biter species that doesn't do this, but they're still in the genus. It's just a snail eater. It's got normal front leg and it only eats snails. That one's boring. So they catch it with their with their front legs and then they inject it with a, it says a powerful saliva and it liquefies its insides and they suck all the liquefied remains out of, with their little tube. Yep, they got big wing pads on the back. Some of the species have greatly reduced flight apparatuses. Other ones can fly a little more. They're not really that big on flying, it seems. There's a fun fact here that I'm hesitant to share with you guys because uh, it involves these things leaking fluid out of their anus while they play dead. I guess I just shared it with you guys. But because they do that, their prey thinks that they're dead or humans think that they're dead and pick them up and then they come alive and give them a big old hug with their front. They pinch them, you know? There's not much else. There were some, there were some good fun facts in there. That was, this is an interesting insect, I think. Fun facts are over.
Yeah, they got a head that points down, it looks like. Like where that tube comes out of, or their stinger. I think I gotta make sure I have the eyes kind of facing forward and the head down for it to have that look, you know? So there's like a muscly section on their underbody here that sticks out a little bit. So I gotta, I kinda have to score that off and then carve around it. And then from that section that was carved out, I kinda have to make it curve up to the edge. I just gotta maintain that how it is, that middle part. And then I'll just carve the rest how it needs to be. There is quite a bit of detail. There's a ridge that goes down the middle here and that goes into some valleys that are right here and then it comes back up to the edge. Pretty sure I got this body shaped and roughly carved how it needs to be. I was sure to maintain uh, an unbroken edge along the side of the body here. I think that's going to be really important to get this thing looking how it needs to be. But yeah, I got enough material here to where I can put legs into the side of the... Man, I need to learn bug terminology. I have no idea what you'd call something like that, but I, l I left this nice and meaty so I can stick some legs in it. And this black line right here is where the front uh, grabby claw legs are gonna go. They're actually gonna be attached together and with the with a flexible cable and then I'm gonna set it inside of the head right there. But yeah, looking good, going good. Next step, um, just get more detailed, carving more detailed details. Okay, I've got a healthy amount of details. Focus on this toe biter. It's time to start on the arms and legs. I've thought of like three ways I can do this and I'm leaning, leaning heavily towards this way. So these front claws are gonna be made all out of wood. This is gonna be a section and then this is gonna be a section with a little thing coming off the edge as the, as the pointy claw part. These are gonna be easy. Um, these four legs are gonna be the hardest, I think, because I'm gonna make this section out of wood, connect it with the nylon coated cable, and make this section out of lead, and connect this with the nylon coated cable, and then this is gonna be I don't know yet. But yeah, I plan on doing that with all the other legs down here too wood in the front, lead on this section, and maybe like feather or something. So that requires that I make a mold for the lead pouring, and I'm gonna have to do some pretty delicate work with small pieces of wood for the other sections. It's gonna work. I'm not too worried about it. I think it'll work good.
just cut those wood pieces out and now I'm gonna make a simple mold out of wood for the pieces on the end that are gonna be made out of lead. And they're gonna be made out of lead to give this bait weight. I forgot to mention that. That's gonna weigh down the bottom because all of these legs are gonna be attached to the center of the bottom. So if the bait, you cast it and it lands like that on the surface of the water, it'll be much more inclined to flip over because those legs are hanging off. I was thinking that this bait's too flat to uh, just put lead in the belly. Because even if it, I was thinking even if it did land on the surface like that and all I had was lead in the belly, it wouldn't want to flip over and correct itself. With the legs dangling off, it should have more leverage to flip the bait over. There. They'll go in the mold just like that. I'll just fill this cavity up with lead and it should envelop that wire. And then I can attach the rest of the arm over here. That should work. Thought that I should expose some of the cable too so the lead can kind of get between the threads. I'll have to get this pretty hot before I pour. That way the lead expands into all the cracks in here. Hopefully we can get it the first shot. All right, here we go with the first pour. Hopefully that turned out okay. Looks all right. Those came out really easy. Didn't get it on video, <laughs> sorry. I just flipped it around and went and they popped right out. So really I think that turned out fine. I don't see how I could get better or get any better results with that. So I'm just gonna do that again and that's what we'll have to work with. Yep, that one went really good too. There's a lot of cleanup to do, but the part that I wanted, it formed really well. See if that works again. <laughs> I'm just gonna try to pound these into shape instead of like grinding or something and making lead dust. That way I don't get any um, in my system, you know? It's pretty unhealthy, lead dust. Not too bad. That's probably the worst one, but even it's not too shabby. All right, gonna put together the rest of the legs now. So I just cut that channel and now I'm just gonna try to sand it more open and wide so it can go in there just like that. I think it's gonna be easiest to just glue the wooden piece in first, then shape it, give it some support and stability through the middle. Because I think if I was to just try to shape this as it is, I'd split it right in half. So yeah, I'm gonna glue it. And of course, I'm using super glue and baking soda to fill in this crack. All right, I'm gonna do that for the rest of them and then get back to you guys. All the legs are finished. Uh, I don't know, I might do a little bit more cleaning up, a little bit more shaping on these front ones. That's how all the pieces will be attached on the bottom here. I still gotta cut that groove for the two front ones. Uh, trying to think of what to do next. I got some sanding to do on this guy. There really is not much left. I think I'm just gonna clean these parts up. Uh, then I'm gonna move on to sealing the wood.
I don't think this is gonna overflow. There's no air in that polyurethane, just just in the piece of wood, so we'll see. It's pretty much to a full vacuum right now. I didn't think it would get that crazy. Okay, we're done. So that piece should be totally saturated with polyurethane all the way through. I'll just do this again and everything will be sealed. Ooh. So yeah, the purpose of that vacuum, it was just to uh, replace as much air as possible in these pieces of wood with plastic, just to try to make it stronger. Maybe not entirely necessary, cause uh, I'm gonna put a pretty durable clear coat on these too, but might as well, you know, I got a vacuum chamber, might as well use it. These have to dry, then just, I'm gonna clean them up a little bit, sand them, seal them again, sand them again, seal them again a few times. Then we're gonna paint a toe biter. Never done that before. I think it's perfect now. I'm actually trying to leave some of the wood grain showing on the shell on the back here and then on the head around the eyes i'm trying to make it nice and shiny bottom looks nice and shiny too looks interesting yep same thing for all the arms and legs it's time to paint so yeah i'm going exactly for this kind of brownish it's got some lighter tan tones in it too and a little bit of black. It's these simple paint schemes that can be difficult because the the look of them and the colors and everything looks so simple and then you go for simple on the bait and it looks too simple, looks too plain. Like you gotta kinda go for simple with a little bit of complexity, you know? A little bit of, well, a lot of detail. When it looks simple, go for detail. When it looks really detailed, try to go for simple. It's a little, little tip. Probably won't get you far, but that's what I do. Also, I'm gonna do all of the light colors first, and then I'm gonna go to the dark colors. That's how I'm gonna do the layers. First up, the whole bait's gonna get a coat of fluorescent yellow. This is bright, but it's a good start. From there, I'm gonna go right to a brown. I'm also not even bothering with the white base coat. Just going straight to yellow because this yellow is so bright and it's unnecessarily bright. If I was to put a white base coat under this, it would be even brighter. So I don't, I'm not even bothering. Now, instead of doing the brown, like I said I was gonna do, I'm gonna do this because I just realized I got it. It's called detailed flesh tone. Looks like it would match better. Like when you look at that, it doesn't go straight into brown. It really is kind of a separation of the yellowish color to just black. You don't see a lot of brown. So I'm gonna tame down this yellow a little bit with the flesh tone, and I might even, if that doesn't do the trick, use some yellow ochre. And then we're gonna go to the super, super dark browns and blacks. I was kinda stumped there for a second as to what to paint over this flesh tone to get it more yellowish, cause I, I kinda overdid it with the flesh tone. But I went for gold. Now it matches the color perfectly, and it will really show through once I get the darker stuff, darker tones on here. I'll be able to do a lot of detail on this. For detail, we're gonna get the hand brush out, and we're gonna do every bit of it by hand. This is me kind of not committing with the super dark color yet, so I can make sure that where I want the dark to be, it's gonna look good. And then at the same time, this is gonna add a little bit of depth and detail with more color.
So it's looking good. It has all the right patterns and textures in the paint scheme with a couple of light lines on the back there and in the head, but it's way too light. I'm gonna take this and cover it in a really light coat of the lightest black that I have. It's called Detail Smoke Black. It's almost gray. We're gonna tone this thing down. The only yellow that shows through is the gold because it's pearlized. It has a, that gives it that uh, beetly look, you know? Exoskeleton look, I think. I think I might go even darker. You can see on that one, the shell's like black on the top. Camera's picking up a lot of light. In person, it looks really dark. Yeah, it looks darker there because I'm not in the light or I'm not right under a light. That's pretty good. I think that's good. It's finished. Uh, the last stuff that I did was just some really light passovers with different colors with the airbrush. I put some silver on the back where the, the wings actually show through a little bit. Uh, I did some iridescent red on the head so the eyes will glow with a little bit of red or the eyes will reflect a little bit of red in the light. Yeah, just adjusted the tones with some really detailed black to get it looking like the picture. Also finished the arms and legs here. Got those really detailed. You know what it's time for. Clear coat. Actually, I take that back. We're, we're still gonna clear coat, but we're not gonna do an epoxy clear coat. We're gonna dip this bait. And we're gonna dip this bait because uh, there is a lot of pretty shallow detail on the body of this bait and on the belly that I'm totally gonna lose if I put a thick epoxy clear coat on it and it's dark. That's the main thing. If it was a lighter color, I could probably get away with it and you would still see through the clear coat and the, the carved detail of the bait, but it's dark and I'm just gonna lose it all if I do a I'm just repeating myself now. We're gonna do a dip clear coat. And this is a KBS Diamond Clear is what, it, is what it's called. Quick and easy. Ooh. Maybe not so easy. I made some weird noises there, but we got it. I love using this stuff. Because it's that easy. Got to watch those smaller pieces for probably like 15 minutes and get make sure you get all of the drip off of them. I don't have anything attached to them that catches the drip and drains it off. but. That's the main thing with this clear coat. You don't want the drippage to pool up at the bottom because as it's curing, this stuff lets off air. It's a moisture cure kind of clear coat. And uh, the air will actually get caught in the clear coat and there'll be, there will be bubbles if you don't have sufficient drip off. So I just use like an old piece of sandpaper or a piece of paper and collect the drip probably like three, four times over the course of like 15, 20 minutes, and then they're good. Also, if you're doing multiple layers of this KBS stuff, air will keep coming off of it when it's tacky, but set up still. And so you would think you can just uh, give it another dip, but that'll put bubbles under the next uh, clear coat. So this, stuff, this stuff's a little finicky. You have to know the drying time and you have to not push it or you're gonna get bubbles in your clear coat. But once you know what to do, it's perfect. It's a super, super durable clear coat. It's a couple days and a couple or a few clear coats later. Now we just got to put this thing together. It's going to be really simple. Just all of these threaded cables just need to be glued into the bait. I do need to also glue in some line ties and hook hangers. There's the middle ones. There, that's all the back legs.
There's the line tie on the front. I'm gonna do two on the bottom. Hook hangers on the bottom. Adding some feathers to the back legs so it's not just wire. I don't think I'm gonna do it to the middle ones. They're kind of hidden and tucked away, but it'll look good on the back ones, I think. There, that looks pretty cool. I think it's done. I need to see what this thing does in the water. The opposite of what they do naturally. Naturally, they sit in the water and do this, and they look like a leaf. And anything that comes by, they snatch it. But uh, I was planning for this. Um, I already know what I'm going to do to give this thing action. It is done. Creepiest bait I've ever made. Oh, I need to explain what I was thinking for the action on this guy. So it just snowed a few inches last night. It's cold. Uh, it's winter. <laughs> Duh. So I was trying to accommodate for that in this bait. And it's definitely not normal, but I was trying to uh, make sure I can use this bait as a drop shot, like a hard body drop shot bait. I'm going to put a drop shot sinker in front of this. Um, I might not rig it up as a traditional drop shot rig though. Just put the weight right here. Um, this bait, it wants to sink uh, butt first, but not too butt first. The center of gravity is set back just a little bit and it makes it sink this way. That way when I, when the line gets pulled and there's a weight in front of it, it'll bring the body down and then it will come uh, back up like this, float back up. As you saw, it floated in the tank. That's what I'm going for. I'm gonna go to the river. I think the water's down. I think I'm gonna be able to get to a good spot on the river where I've caught fish in the winter before and we'll see how this lure does. Obviously, we will, we will see how this lure does. I don't know why I say that every video. I'm gonna do my darndest to catch a fish today. No promises. <laughs> it's really not that cold out. It's not very windy. That goes a long way. Uh, let's get to the fishing spot. I don't even know why I'm talking to a camera. <laughs> Well, it works as it's supposed to. Does the whole this thing. It's really hard to show because the water's not as clear as I thought it would be, but. Been out here for about a half an hour. Haven't seen any signs of life whatsoever, but I'll stay out here, keep casting, keep trying. Might get something, you know. This is the best spot I can find that's still open water because this is all backwater and kind of it, slow, it slows down a lot right here so I'm assuming this might be where the fish are but lakes and ponds are frozen so this is all I got. Well, that really wasn't all that bad. Uh, wasn't that cold, it's just really snowy. Didn't see anything when it comes to activity in the water or on the water. Or... It was pretty dead. Fish for quite a while, nothing. But that's to be expected for a Iowa winter. There's a lot of people out here at this park. They're everywhere. I wouldn't, you wouldn't think on a day like today, but I guess it's Saturday. I don't know these people. I don't know why they're gathering around my car. Anyway, 
Uh, might be the fishing reel next video. Might be another lure, I don't know. I got a lot to think about when it comes to that fishing reel. A lot of designing left to do, but still. On to the next bait.